what we're doing tonight is starting um, in this area, but we, as I mentioned earlier, this is number 14 out of 32. We're debating. <laughs> 14 or 15 out of 32 of these community engagement sessions, and we're moving all around the province. We're going to every one of our communities, and we're having the same conversation everywhere that we go. Um, there are booklets in front of you, and we're going to be getting to those shortly. But in, in, in order to get us started, what we're going to be doing is uh, a little bit of a, a catch-up or a refresher to sort of set a baseline. Um, and we recognize that everyone's at different stages or levels of understanding in terms of who we are as the Métis Nation of Ontario, certainly in terms of our governance structure, and so that's a big part of what we're trying to do here. So how was everyone's dinner? Yeah. Wasn't that awesome? So remind me when the cooks come back in the room that we should acknowledge them because that was a really fabulous dinner. Um, and so whoever's brilliant idea that was to get these caters, uh, we absolutely need to thank them. So a lot of the work that we're doing right now within the Métis Nation of Ontario is telling our story. It's telling the story of who the Métis are. It's telling the story of our communities, our Métis communities here in Ontario. And we're telling the story of historic Métis communities here in Ontario. And it's important that we, we start with that history. We start with those foundations of who we are and where we come from. That, that is, in fact, the foundation for everything, all of, the, all of the recognition that we have right now, the recognition of us as a rights-bearing people. It all flows from our history. And so what we're going to be doing tonight is telling a little bit about that work that we're engaged in right now. And, th and that work of telling our story is happening certainly within the MNO's public service. It's absolutely happening at your council level. And all of the members of your council are, are very much engaged in this work. And it's absolutely happening at the leadership level as well within the MNO, whether, whether we're sitting down and talking with political leaders um, or with bureaucrats and talking about the need and the importance of ensuring that there's appropriate programs and services or awareness within various areas on who we are as Métis. So in order to tell that story, we need to go back and we need to tell that story in the, from history, that story of where the Métis people came from. You might be familiar with this um, graphic image that um, you would have seen before in a few different presentations that our legal counsel has used. And what we're trying to do with this is to show you that, that oval area that really covers that St. Lawrence, that waterway. This, was, this, was, this part of the country was settled very early on in Canada's history. This is where the heart of commerce was. This is where trade came in. This, there, was, there was seats of government in these areas in very early days. And so settlement in that upper lower tract and over into the Atlantic provinces, these areas were settled very early in our history as a country. And this area, this large swath of land that you see tracking west and north of upper and lower Canada, that at the time was referred to as the historic northwest. And what the historic northwest looked like shifted a little bit over time. But in its early stages, this is what we meant when we were referring to the historic northwest it was all the lands north and west of Upper and Lower Canada. And you can see that they track over northern United States, certainly um, a good swath of Ontario, all of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, up into northern British Columbia and up into the Northwest Territories. These areas were areas that were set aside, that were protected from settlement in order to allow the fur trade to flourish. And in fact, the fur trade was the economic engine. The fur trade was the focus of everything that happened in this country. And in order to have a functioning fur trade, these companies, these fur trade companies, so uh, European fur trade companies, employed European men who came over to work, to travel along these fur trade routes, to trade at the posts. They established relationships with First Nation communities, with trappers and hunters. They also established relationships with First Nations women. And as a result of those relationships, we would see families of mixed race, children with both First Nations and European parents, forming. And throughout this historic Northwest, along those fur trade routes, in and around those fur trade posts, you would see these families of people that had both European and First Nation ancestry, these families starting to coalesce. Because these were, these were the, the, the fur trade routes were the highways. Those fur trade posts and the fur trade routes, these were the areas of commerce and the highways um, within our country's history. And so over the period of several, several generations, what we saw was the prevalence of these children of these families marrying other children of similar families 
marrying like, like people. So you would have these children of, of both First Nation and, and um, European parenting. You would have the children and their children and their children's children marrying other children of similar families. And that process has been referred to as endogamy, this notion of marrying somebody like you, right? So over the course of several generations, what you saw evolving over time, the show's about to start, ladies and gentlemen, if you could please take your seat. Over the course of several generations, we started to see the formation of distinct communities. It's communities that, that developed a distinct identity. And when I say distinct, I mean distinct from First Nations, distinct from Euro European or Euro-Canadian, but distinct identities as Métis people. They may not have used that term. There's lots of different terms that were used to refer to what we now use the term Métis. But they were distinct communities of people that were on the land, in the territories, in the southern parts of this country, along with First Nations, and the northern parts, obviously. I am going to, I am going to acknowledge the cooks right now. I, I have been told by Senator Verna porter Brunel that it is now time to acknowledge the chefs for the meal that they provided us this evening. And that has now been memorialized forever in the video recording that we're doing of this evening's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we see the emergence then of distinct, a new people essentially. This process is referred to as ethnogenesis, the birth of a peoples. That's what we mean when we say ethnogenesis. And so really what's fundamental in understanding this is it's a new peoples. It's a people that actually don't identify as First Nations. They have relations that are First Nations, and they don't also identify as European or Euro-Canadian. They identify as something distinct. And it's that distinct identity, it's this people that came to be, that came to exist with their own distinct customs, traditions, language, the Machif language, many dialects, but a Machif language. It's this distinctness of these Métis communities, that is what is the foundation for the recognition of Métis people as one of Canada's Aboriginal peoples. That's where that recognition comes from. And so when we talk about Métis rights as an example, all of that recognition, those rights that we talk about, they all flow from those historic Métis communities that were on the land, in the territories, before Canada was Canada, before Ontario was Ontario. That's where that recognition comes from. And as the Métis Nation of Ontario, we have chosen to, to represent Métis people that are the modern-day descendants of those historic Métis communities. So that's, that's very much that history is all focusing around the fur trade. And as we move over out into the West, it's also focusing around things like the buffalo hunt. But our people were very much active participants in the economy. In fact, I think arguably Canada was built on the backs of Métis people. We were the people, we were the go-betweens. We were the ones that facilitated trade. And so here in Ontario, we see, this is just an old map of some historic fur trade routes. You see them tracking all the way from Montreal, which one of the fur trade companies in particular, they brought all of their goods in through Montreal, took all the fur trade fur out through Montreal and then tracking along over on top of the Great Lakes, over into the Northwest, but also up towards the James Bay area. This, this, this fur trade routes, these, these highways essentially, were the areas in which our communities were gathered. And in fact, when you look to see where our communities are located today, it still tracks back to that history. We also saw a, a few significant events within our history that really helped to shape the formation of these our regional rights-bearing communities here in Ontario. And what we, we know from the facts of history that there, was, there were times when, with the encroachment of surveyors, with the encroachment of settlement, that Métis people all across the homeland were standing up and saying, no, you have to deal with us, we need to talk about this, these are actually our lands. We have some fantastic examples of that, that Métis standing up and saying no here in Ontario, and some of them of course, are very famous, the uh, Red River Rebellion, as it was framed, the resistance in, in Batoche, the Battle of Batoche, the Northwest Rebellion, the Micah Bay Incident. These are all examples of Métis standing to say, 
you need to stop what you're doing with this push for settlement and we need to talk because these are our territories and you need to respect that. And that's, that history is one that is very loaded for us. It's something that I think we can all be very proud of, but it also, those, those uprisings as they were framed, the, the act of standing as Métis and saying, no, we're gonna resist this process and we're going to demand that you deal with us, led in a, at least a couple of occasions to some, uh, to some very traumatic and violent interactions. And of course, we have felt the impact of those here in Ontario as well. But I'm gonna back up a little bit though um, before I get into that to talk about the impact, if you could go one slide back please, Kelly. The impact um, in terms of those fur trade routes and another uh, major event within our history as Métis people was the merger of the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company. Those two fur trade companies merged. And in 1820, when that event occurred, ed everything that happened post 1821 really took on a different flavor for us. And this has a big impact on Métis in Ontario because prior to that date, with these fur trade routes that came in through Montreal, over around the Great Lakes, up towards James Bay, out onto the, out onto the prairies, and a whole network across the prairies up into Hudson's Bay, up into that York factory, there were these two companies that were competing, essentially, that merged, and in 1821, the Hudson's Bay Company essentially took over um, and, and made the decisions with regards to where those fur, what fur trade routes would be used. So at that point in time, the Hudson's Bay Company started to take their furs out through the northern route, up through the, the Hudson's Bay area. And in fact, the old northwest um, fur trade routes that tracked across the Great Lakes and then west of Superior and out onto the prairies, there was a break in that line. There was a break in that line when the decision was made with the merger. And what we saw at that point in time, while there had been a huge amount of east-west movement of Métis across those east-west um, fur trade routes and among the, among the posts, a lot of movement. After that merger happened, those fur trade routes stopped being used. And so th there was a time when for Métis and Ontario, those communities essentially turned inward in terms of their development. And we see in, in terms of the facts of history, the development then of a distinct Great Lakes Métis area. We also see this development of a distinct Mattawa, Ottawa River regional Métis community that tracked from the Ottawa River, Mattawa River, up towards James Bay and over a little bit west. And so there was, a, there was a bit of a break in history in that point in time in terms of the relationships that we had with Métis that were in the west. And that's another, another fact of our history that we're still dealing with today. So that history of the fur trade is so critically important to us. Of course, the fur trade didn't last forever. And at some point, the fur trade collapsed. The insatiable desire for fancy fur hats for men in Europe waned and in fact as Métis in, in Ontario and elsewhere we looked to other other forms of commerce other forms of making a living and what we see in Ontario is a certain ad additional amount of movement there we see Métis communities that were up along the, Jam the James Bay River uh, James Bay area for example um, that essentially moved south to where the railroads were they moved south to where the mining jobs were where the forestry jobs were there were some Métis that stayed in the north, but they essentially were, were adopted into the Cree communities up there. And so this is also part of our history. As Métis people, we, have, we are very industrious, and we provide for our families, and we move to where the opportunities were. So there's, there's additional movement that's come with that part of our history. Then the other thing that we know as a result of whether it's the Micah Bay incident in 1850, whether it's the whether it's the, what happened at, within, as Manitoba was negotiated into confederation with the, with the Red River Rebellion, or the events with the Battle of Batoche, these events all had a very chilling impact on our history as Métis people. And in fact, when we look to see the stories about the soldiers that were sent out to eliminate Louis Riel and to put down the, the Métis resistance um, at the Battle of Batoche, those soldiers, in fact, came from this part of the country. They came from Ontario. They came from the heart of the Orange Lodge. And so the story in Ontario, much like within other areas of the Métis Nation homeland, is one of, we, we've heard these stories, of a reign of terror following the hanging of Louis Riel. We've heard these stories of great violence done to our communities. And we've heard these stories even within our families around the dangers of identifying publicly as Métis people. 
So that's also part of our history is that um, in, across the homeland, thanks to the racism and the colonization within this country, thanks to all of those factors, a lot of our practice around our culture and our traditions, our language turned inwards into our families, into our communities, um, but was again something that it was a dangerous thing for a period of time to be identified publicly as a Métis person. So there's, there's been a, a huge shift in terms when you think about that, when you think about the fact that it was Métis and First Nations that were on the land all throughout Ontario before Canada was Canada, before Ontario was Ontario, to come to a time when it was actually dangerous to even publicly identify yourself as Métis. So an incredible shift there. So our, our communities um, always, always adapt. And of course, in spite of all of those efforts to eradicate us, we are still here. And in fact, we're getting stronger and stronger. In 1982, there was a significant uh, movement for us in terms of the recognition that came in Section 35 of the Constitution Act. So in 1982, we brought the Constitution home from England. And this language uh, under Section 35 was negotiated into the new Constitution for Canada. And that says the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. And it goes on to say that when we say Aboriginal peoples of Canada, that includes Indians or First Nations, Inuit, and the Métis peoples of Canada. So specific recognition there in 1982. So again, huge movement at that point in time to actually give that specific recognition to uh, the Métis nation within Canada. And that again all flows back from the existence of those distinct historic Métis communities, distinct from First Nations, distinct from Inuit, with our, our own culture, language, traditions, our own distinct identity. This is where that legal recognition comes from. And that's why it's so important for us to tell our story and for people to understand that it is in fact grounded in history. This is where um, this identification and articulation of our rights comes from. So in 1982, there's, there, this is negotiated, and it, it is actually a negotiation. This is n by no means a slam dunk for Métis people. Our leaders fought very hard to ensure that Métis people were included in Section 35. But it actually wasn't until 2003, with the Pali decision, that there was any clarity around what that actually meant. So 1982, we acknowledged the Aboriginal and Treaty Rights of the Métis Peoples are hereby recognized and affirmed. But up until, 19, uh, up until 2003, there was no law from the Supreme Court of Canada that actually said what that was or what it meant or how you would go about proving that you had a Section 35 right. And it was, can you advance this slide, please, Kelly? It was the decision in Pauley that came from that historic Sault Ste. Marie community, the Pauley family, and in fact, the Métis Nation of Ontario, that brought that litigation forward for the, event, for the recognition of Métis rights under Section 35. And I want to acknowledge Kim Powley and her family. Kim is actually the daughter of Steve Powley, the sister of Roddy Powley. And it was Kim's family and that whole regional community that worked together with the Métis Nation of Ontario to advance, this, to advance this case. They won at every single level of court. And in September of 2003, we finally had a decision from the Supreme Court of Canada that said, there are Métis, and they have rights. This was the watershed decision for Métis rights in Canada, and in fact, it remains the law in terms of proving a Métis right in Canada. So I want to acknowledge the Pallies um, and the work of that community and the Métis Nation of Ontario for advancing this and be a leader in, in pushing the, for the recognition of Métis rights in Canada. So thank you. So of course, none of this is happening in a vacuum. So our communities, while there was a time, there was that reign of terror, there was that period, la grand silence, there was that period of time when our communities really turned inward and we were quite protective around public displays of our culture, of our language, of our traditions. But over the course of time, we began to be more vocal and more, more out there in terms of um, our presence. And in fact, Métis, we see this resurgence of Métis coming out, identifying themselves, and, and actively organizing over the course of several decades. And here in Ontario was no different. Métis people became active and organized in different organizations. Some of them, well, all of them, really, with a pan-Aboriginal focus. 
They were not Métis-specific organizations. And in 1993, there was a decision made that, and keep in mind, 1993 was also the time of that first level of decision in the Pauley case, when we were just starting to get that recognition, albeit not at the Supreme Court. 1993, there was a decision made by Métis people in Ontario to, come, to break away from those pan-Aboriginal organizations and to come together under one banner, one flag, as one nation of people in that Métis nation of Ontario. So there was a decision made at that time that we would have one registry of people. And as the Métis nation of Ontario, we are, that we are a nation of people, we are, we are the people. That is what makes up the Métis nation of Ontario. And with the declaration that was made in the Statement of Prime Purpose in 1993, we declared this is who we are, this is our history, these are our values and our principles as Métis peoples, and in fact, this is what we aspire to achieve. We set out our goals and our objectives. And that statement of prime purpose is as valid today and meaningful today as it was in 1993 when it was first declared by the citizens, when essentially we hung out our flag and said, we are the Métis Nation of Ontario. So that document still absolutely guides us. And we've developed over time our own unique Métis governance structures with the Métis Nation of Ontario. And we've developed this governance structure to ensure that we have representation and leadership at the local level. And again, I want to acknowledge your council for the work that they're doing. They're here to really work to engage with you as citizens and to revitalize that sense of community as Métis people here in this region. So we've got this leadership at the local level. We have representation at the regional level and I want to acknowledge your regional councillor who's joined us. We have representation at the provincial level at the national level, and as leaders, we also advocate at the international level. And so we've established our own governance structure to ensure that we have that meaningful representation for Métis in Ontario. We have um, one of the things that is very important to us as Métis people, and I think this is quite clear from, from everything that I have learned over the course of my lifetime, we believe very strongly in democracy. We believe very strongly that we all, each of us have a voice and we will be heard. This is, this is one of the fa things that make us very, that, that define us, I think, as a people. So every four years, we have within the Métis Nation of Ontario our province-wide ballot box election process. And this is one of the ways that we express ourselves and our democracy in electing our leadership. We have that electoral process at the local level as well. We've established electoral codes to guide that elections at the local level, at the council level, as well as at the provincial level. We've established, in, in uh, 1993, while well, we established the Métis Nation of Ontario as a nation of peoples, it didn't take us very long, to re our leadership very long, to realize that, in fact, we needed to be able to do business. And so we created, in 1994, a legal and an administrative arm of the Métis Nation of Ontario. We incorporated it using Ontario law so that we could conduct business. We established bylaws to deal with that entity, our secretariat. We established MNO, our Métis Nation of Ontario, rules of order as a means of conducting business. And that is something that is continuing to evolve. We're continually looking to say, how can we bring more of our identity, of our culture, into all of those, all of those guiding documents that frame how it is that we conduct ourselves? Um, and of course, the foundation for all of that work is our MNO Statement of Prime Purpose. That, that document is the foundation for everything that we do. So we have been very, our leadership has been very strong. We've been very um, successful in terms of establishing very strong relationships with the province, bilateral relationships with the province of Ontario. And now we're building a very strong, similar, very strong relationship with the Government of Canada. And in fact, we are the only recognized province-wide Métis governance structure within Ontario. Our registry is at the heart of that. Our registry is, the, is essentially, it's the collection, it's the proof that our citizens, in fact, do track back to those historic Métis communities, that we, in fact, are rights-bearing Métis peoples within Ontario. We have um, established several different relationships, and I'm going to come back to this issue of our, of our harvesting agreement. So in 2008, we negotiated our first MNO Ontario Framework Agreement. 
And this was an agreement that we entered into at, at the highest levels of our government and the province of Ontario, that we committed to work together for the identification, for the advancement of the recognition of Métis rights in Ontario. We also committed to working together to make change in terms of the living conditions for our families, the educational opportunities, health, the w health and well-being of our communities. And so under that MNO Ontario Framework Agreement, we've basically identified shared priorities on how we want to improve the lives of Métis people across Ontario. That document, that MNO Ontario Framework Agreement, was renewed in 2014, and we've built into that new framework agreement the, the push for a true trilateral relationship, so the push for that recognition um, with both the provincial and the federal um, governments within Canada. There was another really significant event that I wanted to just flag for us. I mentioned earlier that we incorporated our legal and our administrative arm in 1994, and pretty much immediately our leadership went to the province to say, we've used your legislative tools in order to create this legal and administrative arm, but frankly, they don't really work for us. And this isn't, shouldn't be a big surprise. When the government of Ontario set out to create a Business Corporations Act, they really weren't sitting there thinking, how can we create tools to support Métis self-government? We've used those legal tools to the best that we could, but our leadership, right from, the, right from the moment that we incorporated, told the province, we've used this tool, but it doesn't work for us. And in fact, over the years, it became increasingly problematic with continuing advances in uh, Ontario legislation. And there were a few things that were really important to us that we said had to be addressed. And I just want to touch on a couple of those, those things. One of them was our democratic ballot box election process. So the law that we're incorporated under doesn't actually provide any room for a democratic ballot box province-wide electoral process. In fact, it's made for things like lawn bowling associations, those types of organizations where you might come together once a year for an annual assembly and you can elect some leadership and you move on. We're a nation of people. That is not how we conduct ourselves. And again, as Métis, we are very firm believers in democracy. So that was one of the major concerns that we had. Another major concern that we had was that Ontario law did not provide for, it actually prohibited the participation of youth within our uh, governance structures. And that has always been something that was identified as a key priority for the Métis Nation. And in fact, those weren't the only things that we had problems with. There were many other things, including things like their language use, things like members. We are a nation, we have citizens. There were several things like that that were very problematic that essentially there was no room for our own Métis way of governing. And so we, we approached the province pretty much year after year, pretty much from the moment we incorporated. Finally, in December of 2014, the Premier of Ontario committed to working with us. Her people would work with our people to essentially identify what the problems were and to figure out a solution. And that solution that was figured out was the development of a piece of legislation that Ontario developed, and it's called the Métis Nation of Ontario Secretariat Act. And in December of 2015, after we sat down and talked with government and explained how we have a very beautiful, shiny Métis governance structure that's like a, a, round, a beautiful round peg and jamming it into this tiny little square hole was way too restricting. We explained what the problem was. This is essentially what Ontario came up with as a response. And what the MNO Secretariat Act does is essentially create space. It changes Ontario law to make room for our governance. So it recognizes the Métis Nation of Ontario. It recognizes that we represent our, our citizens and, and collectively, we represent that collective, the collectivity of our citizens and their rights. And the Métis Nation of Ontario Secretariat Act changes Ontario law to make room for our governance. So it creates that space for us. Um, I, I happened to be in the legislature the day that it was passed, and it was really moving because the 45-minute debate over this bill was 45 minutes with all three parties, and this does not happen very often, all three parties stood together in support of the Métis Nation of Ontario Secretariat Act. And they talked about how important the Métis people are in, in Ontario. They acknowledged the Métis Nation of Ontario and our citizens. Um, and in fact, one of them talked about the last time that there was any discussion about the Métis in the Ontario legislature was when a bounty was passed on the head of Louis Riel. 
And that's part of our history too. The Ontario legislature passed a $5,000 bounty. They would give that money to whoever killed Louis Riel. So that's part of our history, and that's, I think, an important thing for us to remember as well. There was a great report that came out last July that I'm going to touch on in a minute, but these are really, this, this is, these are just some of the developments of, uh, some of the developments along the way for the Métis Nation of Ontario that I wanted to draw to your attention. So in terms of our governance structure, at the heart of all of it are our people. It's our people and our communities. And you remember I was talking about those fur trade routes and how they came up from the St. Lawrence and over and up around the Great Lakes and up towards James Bay. You can actually see that our communities still track through those areas today. So you'll recall me saying that you know, we, we very much resisted the, the push. Ontario's push for us when we created our governance structure was, why don't you just create corporations? All your communities can be separate little corporations. And we resisted that saying, we won't do that. We, we are, in fact, aren't a bunch of corporations. We are a nation of people. These are our communities made up of our citizens. And so we created our own structure. And that structure that we created is the chartered community council structure. So what we've done, you'll recall me saying that we, we organized under one banner, one flag, one nation, with one registry. So within the Métis Nation of Ontario, we are all citizens of the Métis Nation of Ontario, one nation. What we've done, though, through these charter agreements is that where leadership come at a local level and they stand up and they say, we want to work to represent citizens in this area, through our charter agreements, we, as in the Métis Nation of Ontario, all of us, we basically authorize those councils to do that work on behalf of our citizens in that council area. That's what the charter agreements are all about. And in fact, you can read the charter for your own council or any of the councils on our website. All of the documents I'm referring to are on the Métis Nation of Ontario website. We also have our provisional council of the Métis Nation of Ontario, our PCMNO, and we have within that, we have an executive uh, consisting of the president, the chair, the vice chair, Secretary Treasurer, we have four senators with one executive senator. We have a youth representative and we have a post-secondary representative. And I think the fact that we have a youth representative and a post-secondary representative speaks to the importance that we place on the perspective of youth and on education. So for all the children in the room, education is important. We also, of course, have our regional councillors, and they are elected within the regions, within the administrative regions that we've identified, to represent the interests of citizens in those areas and to lead the work that's happening within the regions. So I want to acknowledge all the members of PCMNO that are with us this evening. And of course, what we do at PCMNO is we take direction from our citizens in assembly through our annual assemblies, and we're responsible with tasking to ensure that those things are carried out. We have various other bodies within our governance structure that help to advise what it is that we do and how we do it. One of them is the Women's Secretariat of the Métis Nation of Ontario, and we're really fortunate to have one of the members of the Women's Secretariat as one of our commissioners. Pearl Gabona is one of our commissioners. We also have the Métis Nation of Ontario Youth Council, and the chair of the MNO Youth Council, Paul Robitaille, is also one of our commissioners. We have a very active Métis Nation of Ontario Veterans Council, and they are, they are leading the way in terms of that recognition of Métis veterans in Canada. And then, of course, we have our Captains of the Hunt. And that's play, the Captains of the Hunt play a very important role in managing the Métis harvest in Ontario. They're also a part of our governance structure. We have senators, we have women's reps, we have youth reps. We've, we've got several different, uh, many different perspectives represented within our governance structure. And all together, all together, we are... Ultimately, we are the Métis Nation of Ontario. And then, of course, we have to acknowledge our public service because all of the work that we identify that we want to get done, we need the people to be able to do that. And we're really gifted and, and quite blessed to have the people, very committed people that we have, serving our communities and serving this push for the achievement, the recognition of Métis rights um, in Ontario and f continuing to grow our programs and services and continuing to fight to ensure that we close the gaps for our children, for our young people, for our families, on a whole range of issues. So 
this map of the staff locations is actually quite outdated now because thanks to a new program that has been implemented, the Métis Family Wellbeing Program, we're in a position now where we are opening an office in every single one of our 29 Métis Nation of Ontario communities across Ontario. We have staff in every one of those 29 communities. Um, and in fact, we've grown now to just over 200 employees that serve our nation. And so, uh, again, just an acknowledgement of our public service as well. So I mentioned earlier the Pali decision in 2003. So that took about a decade to get. And unfortunately, even though we had a Supreme Court of Canada decision that definitively said there are Métis in Ontario, they have rights. In fact, here's how you go about proving them. And that law, the Pali decision, remains the law in Canada to prove a Métis right. Unfortunately, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources continued to charge our harvesters. They continued, they turned around, and they just continued to charge our harvesters. And our leadership at the time worked very hard to address that with the province and negotiated an, an interim harvesting agreement. And what we said with that interim harvesting agreement was, you need to stop charging our harvester card holders. We, at that point in time, we'd had a harvester card, harvester card registry for about a decade. And we told the province, our harvester cards, they need protection, we want you to no longer charge them, we want you to essentially protect their ability to, to practice that exercise, that right in harvest. The province of Ontario agreed to do that on some conditions. One of the conditions was that we would limit the number of harvester cards that we would issue so that this could be contained, and because again, this was an interim measure. We also agreed that we were going to work on where there was disputes around where those historic communities were, that we would work on those together. And we agreed at the time that this was only a temporary measure and that we were going to work to conduct an independent review of our harvester card registry so that we could show the province that our harvester cards are in fact Section 35 rights holders. And at the point where we complete that independent review, we're going to move past this interim agreement. We're going to be negotiating a permanent harvesting agreement, one that's based on a full recognition of rights. That movement while this was entered into 2004, was intended to be very much a, a temporary thing, that work to do all of that, review all the historic research, to, to look at where those historic communities were, to get ready for that independent review, has taken a fair amount of time. I'm very happy to say that we are now on the cusp of initiating the independent review, and that work is going to be happening over the course of the next several months. That independent review, when we finish it later this year, we're feeling very hopeful and confident that thanks to all the work that our harvesters have done to complete their files, thanks to all of the work that we've done, the re research that we've done, that we're going to be in a position where we can succeed in that independent review. And at the point where we, we achieve that, we've already put the province on notice that you cannot cap constitutional rights, that we will no longer be um, accepting a cap in terms of the number of cards issued, and that we want to be negotiating that permanent harvesting agreement, one that's based on a full recognition of Métis rights in Ontario. So that independent review, we're, we're just about to start it. And when I say we, we're not conducting it. The province isn't conducting it. It's actually an independent party that's going to be conducting it. We also have the Daniels decision. So this came out in April of last year. The Daniels decision was a really important one for us. Up until the Daniels decision in April of 2016, there was no clarity on whether or not, ultimately, Métis had any right of recourse or any relationship that, they could, that they, we could assert with the federal government. So for 150 years, Métis had been saying, just like First Nations, just like Inuit, we need to be treated, we need to be treated fairly by the federal government. We need to have a relationship with the federal government. That needs to be respected. And for 150 years, we had been denied that. This was something that has led to all sorts of problems for us over the years. In fact, we got the runaround. We were the, in a sense, we were the political hot potato. Nobody wanted to deal with the Métis. And that question around jurisdiction meant closed doors for us all the time, everywhere we turned. With the Daniels decision that came out in April of 2016, that question of jurisdiction has finally been put to rest. And the Supreme Court of Canada has found that in fact it's the federal government that has ultimate responsibility with regard to the Métis in Canada. And this all comes down to what happened when the original constitution in 1867 was formed. And at that point in time, 
the, the makers of the Constitution, they had to divvy up, essentially. They had to say what matters are going to fall under the federal jurisdiction and what will fall under provincial jurisdiction. And under the federal jurisdiction was a clause that's called Section 9124 that said that Indians and lands reserved for Indians fell under federal legislative authority. We have been always arguing to say we belong in that section. We belong under that ultimate federal responsibility. And thankfully, uh, it actually, there was, there was never a question with regard to status First Nations people falling into that category. In the late 1930s, the Inuit actually took a reference case to the Supreme Court and they got a decision confirming that for the purpose of jurisdiction that Inuit are Indians under Section 9124. But it took until 2016 for there to be that same confirmation. And finally now, we don't have to fight anymore about whether or not the federal government has legislative authority or, or responsibility to deal with the Métis. That issue is now over with. We don't have to fight now to get that door open to us, which is good. Now we can actually focus on talking about important things, which is very much why we're here tonight. This is very much why we're having this conversation we're having tonight. I should say that the Daniels decision has absolutely nothing to do with Métis rights. It doesn't change who we are as a distinct people. It wasn't poof, all of a sudden we're no longer Métis, we're now Indians. It doesn't mean we have status, none of those things. What it means is that the federal government can no longer say that they don't have a responsibility to deal with us. It's all about jurisdiction. So another big event that happened for us um, came last summer with the Isaac Report. And this report was something that was commissioned by the federal government. They commissioned a, a fellow by the name of Tom Isaac, who's a, an Aboriginal law expert in Canada. They tasked him with talking with Métis governments and others around how to move forward with reconciliation of Métis rights under Section 35 with Canadian sovereignty. There were, they also had to deal with this, the, the outcomes of the Manitoba Métis Federation decision from the Supreme Court that came out in 2013. And that Manitoba Métis Federation decision was all about the claim when Manitoba entered into confederation, there were promises made to give land to those Métis families that were there. And those, those promises were never fulfilled. Manitoba Métis Federation in 1981 filed a claim saying these promises were never fulfilled. Finally, in 2013, they had a decision from the Supreme Court that said this is, this is valid. And in fact, this outstanding work of confederation, these, these promises, they identified it as a matter of national and constitutional import. What the Supreme Court said in the Manitoba Métis Federation case is, we can no longer stand aside and ignore this outstanding question of confederation. We can't have our head in the sand anymore. We actually have to do something to address this issue of reconciliation. We have to make good on these promises that were made. And so, when Tom Isaac issued his report last July, he, and in fact, it's titled A Matter of National and Constitutional Import, which is a quote from the Manitoba Métis Federation case. He, it, it's a, actually a very good document. It's not very long, easy to read. Set, there's 17 specific recommendations on how we should be moving forward with regard to reconciling Section 35 rights for Métis in Canada. But he specifically identifies the Métis Nation of Ontario as an example of Métis government in Canada, he recognizes us as a leader in Métis, advancing Métis rights in Canada. And he draws on not just our government, our Métis Nation of Ontario government, but other Métis governments as well. All of those examples that demonstrate um, our function, essentially, as governments um, for these rights-bearing Métis people in Canada. This is a very good report for, for all Métis people. Because finally, we have um, and in fact, there was a previous report done the, the year prior by a fellow by the name of Doug Eifer that looked specifically at Canada's land claim policy. And he also said, Canada, you need to deal with these outstanding claims. You need to create a process for Métis to be able to bring forward their claims. So with these reports and with this roadmap, essentially, that Tom Isaac has set out, there's, there's real push right now for meaningful movement to provide for this development of a true nation-to-nation, -nation, government to government relationship between Canada and the Métis Nation. And we see that reflected. Um, we, we saw commitments made during the last federal election by the Liberal Party, uh, not just commitments to, with regard to Aboriginal peoples, 
but Métis Nation-specific commitments, about a dozen of those. And we've seen those commitments actually reflected now in the mandate letters that the Prime Minister has given to his Cabinet. And those mandate letters are essentially the marching orders that he's given to his Cabinet. What he's identified, what the government has identified as one of the top priorities, is, is, is basically establishing those nation-to-nation, -nation, government to government relationships with all of Canada's Indigenous peoples, including the Métis Nation. We're seeing this playing out. We saw a commitment last December from the Prime Minister of Canada to establish a permanent bilateral mechanism between Canada, the Government of Canada, and the Métis Nation, which includes the Métis Nation of Ontario. And in fact, we're coming up very soon on the first ever Crown Métis Nation Summit, which will be a meeting of Métis Nation leaders. So I will be there representing the Métis Nation of Ontario, but also the other four Métis Nation governments and the national, um, the national president of the Métis National Council will be meeting directly with the Prime Minister and with key members of his cabinet. And we're going to be talking about what are some shared objectives, some shared priorities, things that we want to move on going forward from a national perspective. On top of that national process, we've now just on February 3rd signed a nation-to-nation -nation agreement with the Government of Canada in a memorandum of understanding to advance reconciliation. This is a, a huge achievement for us. Keep in mind that up until the election of this federal government, all attempts for our leadership to have bilateral meetings with the Government of Canada with the Minister of what is now Indigenous Northern Affairs had been declined. We've moved that, so within about eight weeks of this government being elected, we had our first bilateral meeting between the President of the Métis Nation of Ontario and the Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs. And fast forward, not very much longer, just over a year longer, and we've actually signed a Memorandum of Understanding on Advancing Reconciliation. And what this MOU does is it commits Canada and the Métis Nation of Ontario to establish an exploratory discussions table. And at that table, we're going to have frank and confidential discussions about what a negotiations process will look like going forward. So think of it as we're not negotiating right now, but we are in fact setting the table for future negotiations. That's what that MOU does. And in fact, what we've done through this MOU is we've put in place a timeline to say, we intend that by the end of September of this year, just in a few months, that we will have a framework agreement in place. That framework agreement is going to come with a mandate from the Cabinet of the Government of Canada, a mandate to actually negotiate with the Métis Nation of Ontario, to negotiate on our rights, including our right of self-governance, to negotiate on our interests, on our claims, those outstanding claims, to negotiate on access to policy and programs and services. So we have moved light years over the course of just a year and a half in terms of this advancement, in terms of our recognition at the national level, at the federal level. And we're committed now to uh, essentially setting the table for a negotiations process that will begin in the very not too distant future. So what that looks like, what self-government looks like, south of the 60th parallel, we are very much in uncharted territory in that there are no examples of Métis self-government south of the 60th parallel. Métis up in the Northwest Territories did sign on to a modern-day treaty, but south of the 60th parallel, there are no examples of Métis self-government in Canada. So we are, we are literally in uncharted waters. What I can tell you in terms of uh, the Claims process in Canada, uh, with, Canadian, with the claims process in Canada, it's a six-step process. With the signing of this MOU, we are at stage two of a six-step process. Stage three is a framework agreement, which we intend to have in place this fall. After we get a framework agreement, we'll be entering into negotiations with government. At some point, we will get to an agreement in principle. And then following that, we'll get to a final agreement and an implementation of the final agreement is the sixth stage. So I mentioned earlier that Manitoba Métis Federation filed a, a claim in 1981, and in 2013, some 30 years later, they got their decision from the Supreme Court of Canada, over $5 million in legal fees. They are one step ahead of us in the claims process. 
So they have, they last May signed a memorandum of understanding on advancing reconciliation. They've led the way with that. And last November, they secured a framework agreement, a mandate from cabinet to move forward with negotiations. So they are just under a year ahead of us in terms of the process. And again, uncharted, uncharted waters. They are, we are all, and in fact, the week that we signed our memorandum of understanding, the, Manit the Métis Nation of Alberta signed theirs as well. So as Métis governments in Canada, Alberta, Ontario, Manitoba, we are pushing forward with these, um, with these movement towards actual negotiations. And all of this sets the framework for and the context for the conversations that we're having tonight and in, in every other community of ours across the province. 